So when we talk of transfer pricing, we're looking at a, a company that has got divisions. So assuming your company has got two divisions, that is a division A and B, and then of course A sells goods to B. These are two divisions of the same enterprise, of the same entity. So however, A also sells to the external market. So else A sells to B internally here, and it also sells goods to the external market. There will therefore be two sources of revenue for A. There'll be external sales revenue from the external market at normal market prices, and then there shall be internal sales revenue from division B at the transfer price. Now, and gentlemen, please listen and listen to me very well. When we talk of a transfer pricing, what are we supposed to remember very fast? When we talk of transfer pricing, this is what you're supposed to remember. This is what you're supposed to remember whenever we talk of transfer pricing. This is what you're supposed to remember. Whenever we talk of transfer pricing, this is what we are supposed to remember. Great. So we are told here that uh, we have got two divisions. We've got two divisions, A versus B. And A is quite lucky because A is able to make some internal sales, is able to make some internal sales, selling goods to B. Of course, the price that uh, B will pay to acquire goods from a sister division here is what we call the transfer price. Transfer price. Meaning at the end of the day that A will be getting some internal revenues. Internal revenues, internal revenues. And then we are told that A has also a market outside there. It's able to sell to external customers direct, directly. It's able to sell to external customers directly. It's able to sell to external customers directly. Now listen and listen to me very well. We are told, I'm repeating again here, that uh, there will be therefore two sources of revenue for A. We have external sales revenue from external market at normal prices, and then we have internal sales revenue from division B at the transfer price. Then what are the aims of uh, a transfer price? Number one, number one, it is to have divisions A and B being autonomous, being independent. So if A feels that, uh, hey, we can get a better price outside there, they easily make their own decisions independently, right? A and the B managers will be motivated. So we're saying, ladies and gentlemen, that transfer pricing could uh, easily also have an effect of motivating the managers. So motivation, why? Because now this guy will be able to earn profits, right? So you'll have, in this case, at the end of the day, every reason to smile because at the end of the day, most managers will be paid bonuses depending on how much they bring into the company as profits. So motivation element is an aim, is an objective, is an objective. Now, as a gentleman from there, I would want us to look at the concept of what here and ensure goal congruence. Goal congruence, remember now, because of this transfer pricing, this will be transformed from a cost center to a profit center, just like this is a profit center. So it means that all divisions in the organization will be pursuing a profit motive, which is the motive of the whole organization. So goal congruence means agreement of goals, agreement of goals, agreement of goals, agreement of goals. Great. Now, after that, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want us to stop there. I would want us to go and uh, ask ourselves, what if this particular organization, this particular organization had, uh, what if this organization had, uh, there is something that uh, this gentleman forgot. If this organization, for example, is, a multinational organization, if it is a multinational organization, then there will be more objectives. There'll be more objectives. The third or fourth objective automatically here will be to minimize what here? To minimize, to minimize, to minimize, to minimize global taxes, global taxes, basically by ensuring that they transfer, they shift their profits, their profits to tax havens. So any tax haven shall be given revenues. You take revenues there and even ensure that there are no costs being incurred there so that most of your profits are shifted towards where? They're shifted towards the tax haven so you don't pay taxes at all. And then very costly, very costly countries, 
costly countries in terms of high taxes, you ensure that uh, you mark up, you ensure that you increase you decrease your expenses in those countries so that at the end of the day, the expenses eat onto the revenues to post a lower profit, if not a loss. So that uh, in this case here, most of your profits will be taken to the other side. Where we have tax havens, whatever institutions you create in the tax havens will be able to invoice the Kenyan department, the Kenyan branch will be able to pay them as a work done and there was no work actually done. So at the end of the day, we are shifting profits. That's a major thing in this world at the moment. Then we have got, uh, in this case, here, another very important assumption called repatriation. Repatriation, repatriation, repatriation of dividends. Repatriation of dividends from countries where we are perceived to be enemies. Countries where we are perceived to be enemies, the very best thing you should do to be able to get uh, your money back home here yeah? is through transfer pricing. You know, there are countries, for example, right now, if you do business in Southern Sudan, not that Southern Sudan is a bad country to us, but they have, in this case here, restrictions where you cannot transfer your profit to Kenya. They'll tell you, just do your business over there, let your company become as rich as you would wish, but whatever you get there shall be used in their, in their soil. So in this case, your profit cannot be done, what here cannot be brought back home. So the very best thing you need to do is to keep on sending your people to your branch in Southern Sudan. When they go there, like they're going to work, you invoice, right? So, you know, it will be quite hard for your organizations to know, or other governments know that that company in Southern Sudan, for example, is related to this other company in Kenya here. So in the process, you are repatriating dividends. You are repatriating money. Just like what is happening with Kenya Airways. Kenya Airways right now is not able to get its billions, billions from Nigeria. You know what is happening in Nigeria? Nigeria, you can't get the Naira out of Nigeria. And even if you got it right now, I mean, things are not very good for the Naira, right? And there are no dollars there. There are no dollars there. So in this case, yeah, the very best thing that should happen, I mean, even if it's in a span of 10 years, if I was to make relations in Kenya Airways, first of all is to stop flights going there, that route. And if they're going that route, I'll insist to be paid in terms of what you do, dollars, right? And then now whatever money that is left there, I'll keep on doing small invoices. Create a company, even here in Kenya. That small company says it's doing business with that with KQ now Nigeria. So it keeps on, in this case, invoicing. They are paid the small bits, the small bits may not. And at the end of the day, the concept here is that uh, we are doing dividend what here? Repatriation. We are repatriating dividends. Great. So those five things at least are very important. You should never forget them. They are very important. Don't forget them. Now, if you look at your syllabus, in terms of transfer pricing, these guys would want us to discuss Ah, this thing is here. When considering a multinational firm, additional objectives are two. Number one, pay lower taxes, duties, and tariffs. Be aware that multinational firms will be keen to transfer profits, if possible, from high-tax countries to low-tax ones. Number two, to repatriate funds from foreign subsidiaries, companies to the head office. Number three, if it's a multinational, we shall use this transfer pricing to be less exposed to foreign exchange what here risks. So at the end of the day, we shall be able to use like what we call the netting and matching ETC, build and maintain a better international competitive position. Enable foreign subsidiaries to match or undercut local competitor prices, have good relations with governments in the countries in which the multinational firm operates. Forget about many of these. Always remember with some multinational firm, ladies and gentlemen, the key objective is to minimize the global taxes. The other key objective is to repatriate funds from these foreign subsidiaries or companies to head office. If these foreign subsidiaries are in countries where we are perceived to be enemies, then we can easily repatriate that money back home using the transfer pricing. Your syllabus wants us to discuss these ethical issues in transfer pricing. There are a number of potential ethical issues for multinational company to consider when formulating that its transfer pricing strategy. Number one, the social responsibility, reducing amounts paid in customs, duties, and tax. That is uh, quite unethical. These big organizations, I know they do that every day, but when you look at it, right, 
automatically we owe a duty to the citizens, like now the Kenyan citizens who have given us a space to operate from, if it's BAT, if it's breweries, we have given these people, I mean, we are uh, giving them residence. We are buying their goods. So if you are doing all those good things to them, why should they deny us our rightful share of taxes? Why should they do that? Number two, by passing a country's financial regulation via remittance of dividends is unethical. Is unethical. A country has said, hey, our money is, your money is from this particular, from this particular uh, country here shall never reach you people. And then here you are circumventing that. You're bypassing that. So at the end of the day, that's an ethical. When things will catch up with you, you will really have yourself to blame. Number three, not operating as a responsible citizen in foreign country. Of course, you are running away from things here, right? Then we have reputational laws. Should you get into the media? If your name gets into the media that you are hiding from, taxes automatically there will be. Uh, that's reputational laws, which is the same as bad publicity. And of course, the biggest uh, unethical uh, practice, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of transfer pricing is the tax evasion. It is the tax evasion. Tax evasion is criminal. It's criminal. Great, great. Now, the other thing that your celebrizer wants us to discuss, ladies and gentlemen, is uh, this concept of what here is this concept of. Uh, Yes, the practical transfer pricing, right? Transfer prices are set using the following techniques. Number one, we have uh, market prices. Number two, we have production cost. Number three, we have what we call negotiations, negotiations, negotiations. Now listen, these are approaches to setting up of transfer prices. When you want to set transfer prices, what do you do? Now listen, this is quite interesting to me. This is quite interesting to me. I like transfer prices because you also work with it at uh, my job, workplace here. We deal quite a lot with transfer prices because we happen to be operating in 140 countries, 140 countries. Uh, and I really pray that as an individual, I'll be able to get uh, a know-how of how to create of how to create uh, accounts and the companies in tax havens. Like I know of some individuals. These individuals, ladies and gentlemen, their salary is paid to accounts in Portugal. Right? Portugal, just like Dubai, there is no pay. Right? Dubai is not a very good tax haven. Dubai will set you up with your government, remember. You know, tax havens are supposed to be what you are very secretive. So when this money goes to Portugal, of course, no pay at all. They'll be able to get a way of uh, bringing that money now from uh, Portugal, right? Now to where? Here. And of course, it's a slow, pro it can even be two, three years like that, but money is accumulating over there. Of course, there will be a small stipend that we pay you in, the, in, in Kenya here as you also try to survive so that you grow your money in a tax haven, in a tax haven like that. So you're shifting your revenues to a different country because we'd want to minimize your what year, we'd want to minimize your tax obligation. I don't mind also having something like that in the future. Is it uh, unethical? Is it unethical? I don't think so, right? I don't think so because even the taxes that we pay, even if, we, even if I was to go to God today, I'll tell God, look, we are paying these taxes and they're not helping us. Where can't I, in this case here, go and set up something there, become rich, and then I'll be able to help so many. I, I'm better off helping people than... <laughs> I can see what Eric is saying there. Now from there, we come straight away to the approaches of uh, setting a transfer price. How do we set a transfer price? There are so many methods you could use. So many methods you could use. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, if you put together these two managers, the managers of A and B, you tell them, hey, you guys, we are locking you up in this room, would want to see smoke coming out that you have agreed on a transfer price to be used. Those guys will end up fighting, fighting, and you'll never see any smoke outside of there. Never. They'll never agree. Because to this guy, the transfer price being charged, or rather to this guy first, the transfer price being charged is a revenue. 
to him being a revenue, you would want this transfer price to go up as high as what he has, millions. How about this guy here who is on the receiving end of the goods? Him, this is a cost. So you'd want that cost here to be minimal. So the two really are at two ends here, which are very conflicting. They will never agree. They'll never agree. And that is why we are saying that you guys don't argue quite a lot. The product that is being produced by A, does it have a market? If it's a product that is being traded, assuming, for example, these guys are producing, for example, Panadol, 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 selling them to, to B, for B to be able to do what you to sell to outside customers. Maybe after they receive, they're going to do a few things here and there to eat, to add value, and then they start selling. So they will ask ourselves, Panadol, do we have shops outside there which are selling Panadol? On average, what is the market price? Should we be able to agree on an average? And then we set a transfer price based on the market price. Quite an important and easy way of setting a, a, of setting a transfer price. But now there is one problem with this. The biggest disadvantage of market value, market prices, is that there could be very many internal goods, goods that are being transferred, goods that are being transferred internally, yeah, which don't trade anywhere. They don't have a market at all. You'll try looking for a market in India, Kenya, wherever there is no market. There is no market. Then automatically, that is a disadvantage. That's a disadvantage. At times, the market prices that you have, ladies and gentlemen, may not be truthful. They may be distorted, right? So for example, assuming you are in the car manufacturing industry, you are making like the Volvos, right? Volvos. So we have our manufacturing plant here. We have a, a, an assembly plant. So this plant, which is manufacturing, would want to really, ladies and gentlemen, go and do what here, sell these parts which are to be assembled to this at a good price. But when they try to look at uh, these particular things outside there, the market of these things of uh, Volvo outside there, I mean, in Kenya, we have a, a wrong perception of uh, most of uh, these uh, mix of cars. Wrong perception. So the certain prices, you'll get somebody like a Mercedes-Benz, trust you me, you'll buy a very good Mercedes-Benz, 3 million, but the day you would want to sell it yourself second hand here, you will cry. You'll even want to bribe somebody to buy it from you. Not that Mercedes-Benz is a bad vehicle, no. No, they are good vehicles, especially when they are new, you can do ages with them without replacing anything. But we have that perception that in Kenya, the car in front is always what here, a Toyota, that's a better car, right? Right? So the market prices that we have at times could be distorted, and really they may not be able to do what here to, whatever you agree, may not be able to help this guy cover their own what here costs, cover their own costs, cover their own costs. Now, when we talk of market prices, remember, I've given you a handout, which I believe you guys can as well read, can as well read here. So they have given us here advantages of market value based transfer prices. So Division A, of course, now will have an autonomy. It's market, remember. If you don't buy my goods, I can get a market outside there. So we have, a, it promotes the concept of what here, independence, right? Also, we have the concept of profit maximization now. Using market price, strangely, you can still expect B to buy from A, as there should be a better quality of service, greater flexibility and dependability of supply. Division A will more likely sell to B than the open market due to cheaper costs of administration, selling, and transport. A market price as the transfer price would therefore result in decisions which would be in the best interest of the group as a whole. As a gentleman, I would have explained this thing even much better. As an advantage, when we tell this person here to sell their goods at the market price, we shall be exposing all these division, divisions to competition, to competition. So when they know that uh, there is competition from out there, and given that uh, the divisions are autonomous, they are allowed to make their own independent decisions, these guys must really do their best in terms of producing uh, high quality goods. They have to do their best in terms of being reliable, 
right? So that uh, this guy does not think about going and getting this component from out there. So when we do that, then automatically we shall be more efficient. And the increased efficiency will automatically increase the organization's profits. So if I'm asked to describe advantages of using market price, number one, I will talk of what here, autonomy, independence of branches. That is so important, just like I told you in the last class, when we talk of independent county governments, I'm telling you, were it not for greatness, were it not for people who really want to steal, who have already stolen from these counties crazily, uh, autonomy of the counties, even right now with all that crazy, crazy theft, most of us have really benefited because of what your county government. Devolution. We are devolving uh, decision making. We are devolving uh, and giving people, right, a better chance of being involved, right, in the county government projects. It is so autonomy has got its own advantages. And because of the efficiency that is being brought up by opening up these divisions here to the market, automatically there will be profit maximization from the farm's perspective. Now, ladies and gentlemen, from there we continue. We are told here disadvantages of market value transfer price. Now, we are told here that the market may not be perfect affected temporarily perhaps by adverse economic conditions or dumping or depend on the volume of output supplied to the external market. I gave you this as a very good point that uh, at times the market price could be distorted because of so many reasons. The market doesn't appreciate your product, ETC. Number two, similarly, products may not be identical in the market, right? A market price works better when division A is at full capacity. Right? If division A has spare capacity, it means no more demand from the external market, then charging a market price doesn't make sense. Here, yeah, I only need you to remember two. Don't remember all the points. Don't remember all the points. You've got better things to think about. So the first one is the concept of market prices being what here distort, distorted. Number two, the concept of what here somebody, that uh, these products we're selling here may not be exactly identical to what is outside there. Number three is the concept of an availability, an availability of that market in the first place, an availability of that market in the first place. Yes, like you can see what Eric Odinga is telling us there, ascertaining prices of some unique products is a limitation of transfer pricing. That is so nice. I wish you guys could put that point down somewhere. It's a disadvantage. There's some unique products, ladies and gentlemen, in this case, that really you won't be able to value very efficiently. Very efficiently. Great. So can I move on to the second method? Can I move on to the second method? Can I move on to the second method? I'm through with market pricing as a basis of transfer pricing as a basis of transfer pricing, Atieno says yes. All right. Now from there we have what we call marginal, it's only one student who has said yes, marginal costing, marginal. When they talk of marginal costing, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, we have A, we have A here. A, in this case here, goes ahead to charge B, marginal cost of uh, what they produce. So remember, we have got two types of costs. We have variable costs, we have fixed costs. So you say, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, us, we are not greedy. We shall charge you guys just the variable cost of producing this pen, the marginal cost only. Does that have an advantage? Yes. This department, of course, will be getting these goods very cheaply, very cheaply from A. So this department here will work so hard right? Because they know the more they sell, the more the revenues, the more the profit they're able to do what you to get, right? So that's a big advantage. And remember, remember, for this particular department, ladies and gentlemen, you may, you may think of them, it's really suffering, right? Not at all. Remember, you are told that sometime when you are doing economics, that at maximum profit, 
at maximum profit, marginal revenue should be equal to marginal room. Marginal revenue should be equal to marginal cost. Marginal revenue should be equal to marginal cost. We are saying that this marginal costing at the end of the day, from the angle of the whole farm, there is a high chance of maximizing what here? Yeah, maximizing profits for the whole organization, right? Because of this marginal revenue. At the end of the day, we shall be using this. Now, of course, the biggest disadvantage, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to this is that uh, this position here yeah, may not be able to recover their fixed cost out of whatever they are selling. So they'll get themselves, again, going back to the head office, making requests of funds to come and meet their what their office rent and ETC rent, ETC salaries, right? So in the short term, it may not be very good for this division, marginal cost, marginal cost. So the gentlemen, we are told here, 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 marginal cost, here division A just charges its variable cost B. This means that it does not cover its fixed cost, and so it's demotivating for division A. Although it's great for division B, A has no incentive either to keep its variable cost low. However, it does mean that uh, B will get its all products here from A. Yes, that's a very big advantage because now those costs are quite low. B is going to get all its products here from A. And this will lead to goal congruence as their marginal cost will be the same as the group as a whole. So, ladies and gentlemen, one thing that I'm able to pick from here is that um, we will never think of getting this particular component from out there. Right. B shall think of getting all the components here from A because of a lower what cost. Does that have an advantage? Oh, yes. It's going to increase what here? Yeah, the profits of the whole farm. How? This department is going to operate at full capacity. Right. This is not getting goods from anywhere. So there is no nothing like idle, idle resources, idle employees, ETC. Right. And again, quality-wise, you know, when you go buying like uh, components from outside there, those components outside there, they have not been uh, ascertained. They have not been, uh, in this case here, a uh, quality, for example, guaranteed by anybody. But when you're buying our own, I mean, very good. So the most important thing, ladies and gentlemen, and you will see this being asked in your exams, uh, you are told here to describe a margin of costing as a basis of transfer pricing. Go ahead and tell us A, eh? will only charge variable cost of producing their components to be as a transfer price. A, of course, will not be able to recover their fixed costs, so they'll be demotivated. But for division B, it's great. From the angle of the whole, whole, whole organization, this will lead to profit what year? Maximization because B now will be forced to procure all the merchandise from who? A, who is now a cost leader, right? ETC, the quality is there. You can't lack something to state for two, three marks, ladies and gentlemen. Now, from there we go to, from there we go to part, next part. This is the full cost based transfer pricing. I love this. Full cost, full cost. So, full cost transfer pricing, ladies and gentlemen, one thing that I would want you to know under full cost, under full cost, when we talk of full cost, full cost, in this case here, we have variable cost plus what here somebody plus fixed cost, you don't get your full cost. So we have our A, we have our B. So at the end of the day, A is charging a full cost. Does that have any disadvantages? Yes. Of course, the advantage is that uh, now A will be very happy because they are able to recover all their co all their costs. All. Variable and fixed. But you see, at the end of the day, there are two key things here that I'm supposed to know. If I'm charging a full cost, it means that I, I'm putting my fixed cost in the product. And the fixed costs are problematic outside here. There can't be truthfulness in how the fixed cost has been uh, apportioned to each unit. But fixed costs are things like rent. So how have you been able to apportion rent to each unit? So automatically, we shall have wrangles between what the two departments. B will be saying, no, you are really overcharging me. 
So there is a very high chance that uh, B may resort because of the economy, B may resort to get their products from where? From outside. So a lot of wrangling, bickering within what year? The organization by rule, departmental heads, right? The other thing, of course, will be, which is a different disadvantage, that apportionment of the fixed overhead to the products is a very technical thing, very technical thing done arbitrarily, and of course, it can never be what here yeah, fair. It can never be fair. It can never be fair. So it will lead to what we call goal incongruence, things breaking up, be buying from outside. These guys trying to look for markets to do what here to sell their goods to. So at the end of the day, there will be what here, yeah, a lot of uh, inefficiencies here, yeah, a lot of idle time there, right? Right, And again, as a gentleman, remember, when you tell these guys now to charge full cost, full cost, these guys here will not be having any incentive to minimize cost. No, no incentive to minimize cost. Then the more the cost they add onto each unit price they are charging, the better, the better, the better. Again, even what makes this full cost uh, a very bad thing, when you hear a company has gone the full cost way, they'll be talking of what you call full cost plus, plus profit. So again, they would want to even get profit on top of what here, the full cost. So they charge a full cost of say 15, and then they say plus a profit of 10% over this 15, so a profit markup. Now, listen here. Yes, due to the fixed cost. Great. Thank you very much. At least you have good points there. And remember for advanced MA, if you don't know the theories very well, you can't really hack this paper. You must know the theories very well. It's important, especially for you guys this semester. Now, let's read this. Let's read this. Transfer price in full cost. Under this approach, Division A charges the full cost, including fixed overheads absorbed. They would still not and any profit, so sometimes a cost plus profit approach is used. If a full cost plus approach is used, a profit margin is also added in this transfer price. If a full cost plus approach is used, a profit margin is also added in the transfer price as repetition. So division A gets some profit at the expense of division B. However, division A has no incentive to keep cost down. Division A will never have any incentive to keep costs down. Although using standard costs instead of actual costs will prevent this, also Division B's variable cost include Division A's fixed cost and the profit. This can lead to the functional decisions. The functional decisions. So ladies and gentlemen, regarding this full cost, the most important thing is that uh, to remember is that uh, and a full cost, products are going to be very expensive. So B may decide to procure from outside. I can see a lot of inefficiencies. I can see a lot of what here, things there being what here, decisions being made, which are very functional. <clears throat> Other approaches to transfer pricing. There are two approaches to transfer pricing which try to preserve the economic information inherent in variable costs while permitting the transfer divisions to make profits and allowing better performance valuation. So we have variable cost plus lump sum. I love this. I love this because I've seen it operating in practical. So under variable cost, we shall just tell A to, A to do what? To sell their goods to be at variable cost only. And then like quarterly, quarterly we shall be looking at you guys we know that uh, you've not been able to recover your fixed cost. So quarterly, we give you a lump sum amount every quarter, a lump sum amount, a lump sum amount. So we are told as a gentleman here, we are told as a gentleman here that variable cost plus lump sum. Here, transfers are made at variable cost, but periodically, a transfer is made between two divisions to account for a fixed cost and what here? Profits, profits. Is that clear, ladies and gentlemen? Is that clear? Is that clear? Is that clear? Is that clear? Variable cost plus lump sums. Variable cost plus lump sums. Is that clear? You simply say Y for yes. Y for yes. Y for yes or N for no. Variable cost plus lump sums. 
variable cost plus lump sum. So under variable cost plus lump sum, what are we doing? Charge your variable cost alone per unit. So 50, 50, 50. But at the back of the mind, what do we know? We know at the back of the mind that these guys are not able to recover their fixed cost. They're not able to recover their fixed costs, right? So every quarterly, others will do it monthly. Every quarterly, you call the managers of the two divisions. Tell them that you know what, there's some unfairness to A here. So what do we do? Let's agree on lump sum amount, like a million shillings every quarter, which is of, which of course is subject to what you have to review. Really, it's about uh, you picking something small there. You know, you don't have to like uh, appreciate the whole thing. It's as straightforward as that, really. That uh, A is charging a variable cost. I hope you know the meaning of variable cost, material cost, labor cost. You charge variable cost to the sister department for your transfer price. But at the end of, say, three months, periodically, at the end of three months, you're given a lump sum amount, a lump sum amount. So I don't think there is anything to expound more than that, not unless I give you, somebody else in this room, a chance to also do what here, explain how do you understand this? You know, there is no monopoly of knowledge. There's no monopoly of knowledge. You guys could even have uh, handled some of these things practically. So, so that is it, variable cost plus a lump sum amount. Lump sum means one off huge figure we're given. Great. Now, as a gentleman, from there we go to the next one. The next one is a dual pricing. Dual, dual here means two. Quite a complicated one. I've never encountered this. Here, division A transfers out at cost plus markup. And the receiving division transfers in at variable cost, at variable cost. Obviously, Division A current accounts won't agree, and some period end adjustments will be needed to reconcile those and eliminate fictitious interdivisional what year profits. So, under dual pricing, we shall say at the end of the day, you guys do what is best for you. Each one of you does what is best to you guys. How do we do this? Very easy. So you see A would want what? A would want full cost plus transfer price. Variable cost, fixed cost plus profit to be the price. B would always want marginal cost, marginal cost or variable cost pricing. So then what we'll be told is that there's no giving of money in between, right? You guys, for example, in a period of six months, maintain your own records. You are maintaining your own records as A, assuming that your price is 30, which in this case includes variable cost, fixed cost, and profit, which is uh, the fixed co uh, full cost plus profit. You be maintaining your books, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, assuming that the price is 30. This other guy will be maintaining his books, assuming that his profit, for example, is not profit, but price. His price or cost of procuring them from A is something very little, like 20. So they maintain like that. And then at the end of the six months, these are dual prices, two prices. At the end of six months, we shall be able to see the managers of A, managers of B plus the head office now. We do a reconciliation and get to know how much is the owing. How much is the owing? So perhaps I read this again would be much better. Great. So we are told here, under dual transfer pricing, that division A transfers out at cost plus markup, and the receiving division transfers in at variable cost. Obviously, the division of current accounts would agree, and some period end adjustments will be needed to reconcile those and eliminate any fictitious interdivision or what your proof is. The key thing, just appreciate high level, high level. Now from there, we go to the next one where we negotiate the transfer prices quite hard because uh, the one who has got uh, superior negotiation skills will always uh, carry the day. So on a negotiated transfer prices, what are we told? In some cases, the divisions of a company are free to negotiate the transfer price between themselves and then to decide whether to buy and sell internally or deal with outside parties. 
Negotiated transfer prices are often employed when market prices are volatile and changes occur constantly. The negotiated transfer price is the outcome of a bargaining process between the supplying and the receiving division and the receiving division. And the receiving division. Sorry, there is a question up here. Who gives the lump sum? Could you kindly try to answer that question between A and B? Who will give the lump sum if you're charging variable cost? You know, you know the department there really, which is a uh, disadvantage, is A. It's charging a lower price. So it's B will give the lump sum. Of course, under the supervision of the head office, it's B will give a lump sum. It's B will give a, sum, a lump sum, yes. It's B will give a lump sum. So I hope ML have been able to answer your question, right? Right, great. So ladies and gentlemen, if you're asked here to describe four methods of setting transfer prices, which methods will you be able to quote very fast? Four methods of uh, setting transfer prices, which methods will you be able to quote very fast? Methods that will be able to quote very fast. Negotiations, negotiated transfer price, I love that. I love that. Answer my question fast. Mm -hmm. which, which methods will you be able, in this case, you have to remember very fast? Negotiated, that's number one. Number two, marginal cost, marginal cost. Number three, full cost method, full cost method. Uh huh. We have the dual pricing, isn't it? Dual pricing, right? We have variable cost, variable cost plus lump sum, right? Variable cost or marginal cost plus lump sum, etc. And then, of course, you're going to ask, ladies and gentlemen, to 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 describe any of the two. You know, they'll give you like two marks to describe, but for example, to understand with full cost. I'll give one description, one liner, plus maybe an advantage. Advantage, of course, uh, you'll be able to tell them that uh, A will be able to receive its uh, cost, fair cost of resources they are supplying. Right? They'll be happy, they'll be motivated. Right? Disadvantage, we have the disadvantage of uh, apportionment of fixed cost is quite a complex thing. B may be forced to acquire goods from outside there because they'll deem. Who supplied by A to be water to be very expensive. So you're writing a few points here and there, and then that way you'll be able to do what here. You'll be able to, yes, yes. Now, ladies and gentlemen, from there, we have this concept of opportunity, what here? Cost. So minimum and the maximum transfer prices. Minimum. So we are told here, Division A will want its variable cost covered. At least Division A's variable cost must be covered when it has fair capacity. Division A will want its variable cost plus any contribution lost by not selling elsewhere if it has a full capacity. Listen, 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 listen here, listen here. So we have our two divisions, A and B. You've gone for a quotation from A. So A will be having what we call a minimum price, a minimum price for the goods. We are saying that if B wants to procure goods from A, A will look at the two sides of the coin. Number one, they will look at how we idle. If we are idle, instead of having our resources being idle, Instead of having our employees not working at all and yet you're paying them salaries at the end of the month, we would rather charge you a price which is exactly equal to our marginal cost. Our marginal cost, which is what your variable cost, so that you meet the price of the raw materials, you meet the cost of what your labor workers. So we charge you the minimum. But what if you come when I'm operating at full capacity, full capacity? And then you come wanting me to make some sacrifices, to create some space for you. If you want me to create some space for you, then what I'll do, number one, I'll charge you the marginal cost. That's the first thing. 
But you see, because I'm already operating at full capacity, it means that for me to be able to produce for you, assuming that this product you want is called X, you want me to produce for you a product called X, it means that I must sacrifice my A, which I'm selling to external customers. So it means, ladies and gentlemen, that I must come here and charge you. So I'll come and charge you add opportunity cost, what I stand to lose. And what I stand to lose will be the contribution margin of my product. The one that I would have gained from external customers. And to get contribution margin, ladies and gentlemen, we will be taking selling price of A minus, of course, the variable cost of A, Thereby, of course, I would have earned this contribution margin. But because you have squeezed me, told me that, hey, stop producing A, right? That please, I've got this that I would want. So I'll charge you the marginal cost plus this lost contribution margin. It may not make sense right now. It needs a question, which you shall be able to do just in a moment. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here we are. So you're told the maximum, the maximum division B will pay is the market price. So maximum is always the market price. If you charge me beyond market price, I'm bright enough, I'll be able to run outside there and procure those things. So if the market price is 10 and you want me to, charge, to pay you 15, I'll tell you, go to hell. I'll go and get the same products at 10. So how to calculate the minimum is what very many students don't know. Maximum will be given to us. So then, as a gentleman, what we shall do without uh, much ado, we should move straight away to, we should be able to move straight away to questions now. To questions, to questions. So they have given us great questions here. They have given us great questions here, which I've also shared with you. They are telling us Division A has limited skill labor and is operating at full capacity, making a Division Y. It has been asked to supply a different product X to division B. So key thing is that we are currently operating at full capacity. So the minimum price we shall charge you will be equal to our variable cost plus what here, any contribution we shall lose, right? So we're told that division B currently sources this product externally for shilling 700. The same grade of materials and labor is used in both products. The cost cards for each product are shown below, are shown below. So then using an opportunity cost approach transfer pricing, what is the minimum transfer price? What is the minimum transfer price? I would want you guys to give this thing a shot. We see whether you'll be able to get the transfer pricing from whatever we have been able to explain. From whatever I've been able to explain, is there somebody who will be able to get this transfer price? Is there somebody who will be able to get this transfer price? Abracadabra. Is there somebody who will be able to get the transfer price? Abracadabra.
So the answer is straightforward. The answer is straightforward. Great. So in the charts, I can't see anything much really. In the charts, I can't see anything much really. So let me do it. Let me do it. So I'll start with the low hanging fruits. I'll start with the low hanging fruits. So we have A and a B. So in this case here, B, B has made a request. So B needs X from A. So then X, how much will X cost? So the first thing that I'll do, I have to calculate the marginal cost of X. The marginal cost of X, this is not debatable. Marginal cost of X has to be given to me. That one is not debatable at all. Because if I produce for you X and you don't meet the entire costing, marginal cost of X, then I'll start making losses. So the marginal cost of X has to be calculated. This is not debatable at all. Great. So marginal cost of X, do we have this? So marginal cost of X, do we have this? So you can see marginal cost of X we have here, direct materials and direct labor. Please don't bring fixed overheads. So direct labor and direct material, we have 150 plus 120. For your vision, you can write here 150, 150 plus what here? 120. Which gives me how much was on German here? This gives me 200 what here? 270. Now from there, I'll come and ask myself, fine, this guy wants me to produce X for him. The X is going to cost me in terms of materials and labor 270. If I am idle, hooray, I'll accept this 270, I make for him X. But now I'm not idle. I'm not idle. I'm not idle at all. So in this case here, there is a, a sacrifice that I'll make. I've been told here that currently I'm operating at full capacity. I'm operating at full capacity. I'm told here that Division A has limited skill labor and is operating at full capacity, making product Y, making product Y currently. So this Y that we are producing, how much does it contribute to the organization? Give me the contribution of Y. Give me the contribution of Y to the organization because I'm going to sacrifice, I'm going to relinquish, I'm going to leave that contribution. So come and give me, add here, contribution margin of Y. So this contribution margin of Y, I know contribution margin is price minus variable. So what is the selling price of Y? Can somebody talk to me? What is the selling price of Y? What is the selling price of Y? The selling price of Y, according to Eric, is 600. The selling price of Y is 600. So the selling price of Y is 600 minus the variable cost of y, minus the variable cost of y, the variable cost of y, 
minus the variable cost of y. So the variable cost of y, what do we have here as the variable cost of y? You can see there are two of them. We have materials, 200, and then we have labor, 80. So 200 plus 80, that gives me how much here? 280, 280. So 200 plus 80, 200 plus 80, this gives me uh, 280. So what is 600? What is 600 minus 280? Somebody help me out here. 600 minus 280 gives me how much? 600 minus 280 gives me how much? 600 minus 280 gives me how much? Somebody help me here. 320. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. 320. 320. But now remember, remember that this, this is pegged on some resource. It is not all the resources here that are stretched to full capacity. No, it's only labor. It's only labor that is stretched to full capacity. It's only labor, skill labor. Actually, they've told us here, if you read, you, you know, ordinarily, I know what most of us will do. Most of us will come and take this 320 and they say, hey, add it there. No, that is normally the case if all of them then are scarce, right? Here, yeah, it's only labor that I would want to get. Uh, it's a uh, uh, opportunity cost. So it's only labor that I would want to get its opportunity cost. So they have told me here, Division A has limited skill labor. So if they tell me like that, I would want you guys to tell me how many hours do we need to produce Y? How many hours do we need to produce X? Can somebody in this case say, give me the number of hours? Can somebody come and divide this eta with 20 and then you divide 120 with 20? Abracadabra, abracadabra, abracadabra. Abracadabra, they're not talking to me because I would want to get the labor hours for Y and the labor hours for who? For X. Labor hours for Y and the labor hours for X. So labor hours for Y. So I know that one hour equals 20 bob. How about the number of hours in the 80? How about number of hours in the 80? So if I cross multiply, this will be 80 times one hour divided by 20, which gives me how much here? Four hours. So for why I need a whole four hours. That's why. And the X, ladies and gentlemen, X, how many hours do I need for X? So labor hours, labor hours for X. So labor hours for X, I will take the 120 divided by 20. 20 is a rate of paying these workers. 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 You've told us here yeah, Kenya is 20 for one hour per hour. Per hour. So in this case here, 120 divided by 20 gives me how many hours here? Somebody? Six hours for six hours for X. Now, listen, ladies and gentlemen, I know this is something that you have ever done before. Whenever we talk of limiting factor, limiting factor, limiting factor. There is that place where we take contribution margin divided by limiting factor hours, for example. So this is the contribution for our whole product, Y. But you see, I would want to get this as a limiting factor per hour. So then this will be 320, 320 divided by four. So every hour that I spend in this company A, in this company, company A, how much do I earn? What is the contribution per hour? 320 divided by the four hours. Remember why we need four hours. Why we need four hours. Why is being made by B? So in this case here, 320 divided by four. So we earn eight shillings, eight shillings per hour, per hour. Eight shillings per hour, eight shillings per hour, eight shillings per hour, but X. This guy has come in this case here demanding for X for me, but X needs, X needs how many hours? X needs six hours in total. Six hours in total. And I know that each hour, the sacrifice I'm making for each hour is 80. The sacrifice that I'm making for each hour is 80. So what is six times 80? Six times 80. Can somebody give me six times 80? That gives me how much? It gives me 400 and what year? 480. So this is the total contribution to be lost. Should I decide to produce X for my sister department, I'm going to lose a whole 480 plus the cost 
of making this X now, the cost of making X is 270. So when you add the two, the maximum or rather the, the, the minimum price this guy should pay me, the price, the transfer price, the transfer price, the transfer price will be 270 plus 480. 270 plus 480 will give me how much, yes, please and gentlemen. 270 plus eight, uh, 480 will give me 750. Now I would want to repeat this and repeat this nicely. The transfer price there will be 750, but I would want to repeat and repeat this nicely. I would want to repeat and repeat this nicely. I would want to repeat and repeat this nicely. Listen. Listen. We have two divisions. I want to repeat this. This is something we must repeat like twice or thrice because at the end of the day, it's like it covers two topics. Right? So, right? Yes. So, we have got two divisions here. So, we have division A and then we have division B. A makes a product called Y. Right? Right? Makes a product called Y. And why, you've been able to tell me that why gives us a contribution of 600 minus 280. You guys gave me a contribution margin of y. Please give me this contribution margin of y is how much? Contribution margin of y is how much? You've given me the figure. It's 320. 320. 320 per unit. Thank you very much. 320 per unit. Thank you very much. Now, listen and listen to me very well. B has made a request. B requests, request, request. B requests A to produce product X. Product X, whose marginal cost is how much? Whose marginal cost? Whose marginal cost? Because when we are pricing, marginal cost automatically becomes the lowest. Whose marginal cost is what? This product X, I would want to know as a management accountant, I would want to know how much is the marginal cost of X that, that, that B wants me to produce. Remember here we are told here that division A has limited skill labor and is operating at full capacity making product X. It has been asked to supply a different product called X to division B. Now this product X, the marginal cost is 150 plus 120 materials and labor. 150 plus 120, that gives me how much here? 270. 270. So for your revision, it'll be important for you to write these components. For your revision, it'll be important for you to write these components. So we have, ladies and gentlemen, we have, ladies and gentlemen here, we have, ladies and gentlemen here, 150 plus, 150 plus, 120 there. So 150 plus 120 here. So we have here 150 plus 120, which gives me 200 what here? 70. Great. So far, so good. Now from there, I need this limiting factor. The limiting factor. So the limiting factor, these are the skilled hours, the labor hours. Now I have the skilled, so the labor hours. So labor hours in A, and then we have labor hours in B, labor hours in B, labor hours in B, labor hours in B, labor hours in B. So labor hours in A, these guys gave me labor cost. They gave me labor cost. These guys gave me labor cost, labor cost for the two divisions. But fortunately, I have the rate of paying these workers, which is 20. So how do I change the labor cost to labor hours? It's very easy. I should take 80 divided by 20. So in this case here, y will be 80 divided by 20, which gives me 4. 120 divided by 20, which gives me 6. So 80 divided by 20, 80 divided by 20, this gives me 4. And then here we have 120 divided by what here? 20, which gives me 6 hours. 6, six hours. 6 hours. So now the question is, in terms of labor, I'm asking myself, should I produce this product X, which needs six hours, which needs six hours in total? How much contribution will I lose here? 
Remember that four hours in A producing Y, four hours currently is giving me a contribution of how much? 320. Four hours is giving me 320. For every four hours I utilize in A, I get 420. How about now B, who wants me to sacrifice six hours for him? Six hours. How about in this case here, six hours? Six hours working with the total contribution. How much will I earn? If in four hours I'm earning 320, in six hours I should earn how much? Right? Right? So if you cross multiply, it will be six times 320 divided by four. Right? It will be six here. This will be six times 320 divided by four, which gives me 480. So meaning that should I continue producing a product Y at this rate for six hours, then I'll be able to earn 480. And then we have got this bad fellow, Baga, who wants me, ladies and gentlemen, to stop doing my work, to stop doing my work, to produce X for him. Let's, in this case, here punish him. So in this case, I'll come and give up a cost statement. A cost statement of producing X, of course, by A, by division A. So in this case here, first of all, we have to charge them the marginal cost of X. So marginal cost of X, what do we have? The marginal cost of X, that is not negotiable. Because for every product we produce, we must incur our total cost. We, we, we must recover our marginal cost. That's not negotiable. So marginal cost of X is 270 plus, plus the lost contribution. The lost contribution for not producing Y. For not producing Y. For not producing Y, I know I'm missing 320, but remember the hours are being stretched a little bit. So plus lost contribution for not producing Y, this will be how much? 480. That is how you are able to get this as the 750. 750. So this is the price to charge. Price to charge. So this becomes what we call the minimum price. If there is a market price somewhere, I'll be saying minimum is 750 vis-a-vis -vis the maximum, which is the market price. So I don't know whether this has made some little meaning. I don't know. Or do you have questions? This normally comes with practice. The concept will come much better with practice. Okay, great. So I hope you've been able to take method one, method number two. Great, so I want us to do the last question for today. The last question for today, which is here. The last question for today, which is here. I can see the number is dropping, I know why. Some of you could be having some class. So you can see the correct answer is being given there. And then we have now question number two. Question number two is one of those interesting questions that I love. Question number two. Ox company has two divisions A and B. Division A makes a component for air conditioning units, which it can only sell to division B. It has no other outlet for sales. Current information written to division A is as follows. Marginal cost per unit is 100. Transfer price of the component is 165. Total production and the sales of the component each year is 2,200, right? Specific fixed cost of division A, we are talking of 10,000, 10,000, the specific cold company has offered to sell the component to division B for 140 per unit. If division B accepts this offer, division A will be closed. Division A will be closed. Division A will be closed. If Division B accepts cold company's offer, what will be the impact on profits per year for the group as a whole? This is a very nice question for advanced MA. I'm telling you so many students here will not score any mark. I have a, I have a shortcut. I have an approach for this. I have an approach for this. I have an approach for this. This is so interesting. 
have an approach for this. And I believe this approach is the best. This approach is the best. So the gentlemen, listen and listen to me very well. I'm looking at the impact of closing A. I'm looking at the impact of closing A. The impact of closing A. When I close A today, the very first thing I will be able to do is to save some fixed costs because there are some fixed costs which are attributable to existence of A alone. All right. We have some fixed costs, ladies and gentlemen, which are specific to A. So then if I close A, I'm able to see these in my mind. If I close A, if I close A, if I close A, those fixed costs will be saved. So we have the closure of A, closure of A. So in this case here, we have uh, uh, savings, savings of specific fixed costs. Remember, general fixed costs cannot be closed, cannot be saved because of closed department. The general can never, but specific, please listen to me, specific fixed costs will always be saved whenever you close a department. So in this case, a specific fixed cost which will be saved, this will be 10,000, this will be saved, this is the savings. So remember, I'm trying to look at the cost vis-a-vis -vis the benefit on the other side. Right? Right? So when I close A, the benefit is that I'm going to save this. How about the cost? There's a disadvantage. There's an increase in variable cost. So there is an increase. There is an increase in variable cost. In variable cost. How does this come about? Remember, ladies and gentlemen, that we have a department. Remember that we have a company called Cold that has come telling us that, you know what? I'm going to give you this product at what price if you're following? I'm going to give you this product at what price if you're following? Okay. So if you're following, if you're following, Doreen, Doreen, Doreen has really followed this. So in this case, ladies and gentlemen, in this case, ladies and gentlemen, we are told here, we are told here that company called has offered to sell the component for how much at the moment? It's 140 per unit. Even if B accepts this offer. So you can see these people are going to sell to us this particular product at 140. 140. But remember ourselves, the cost that we were asking to be paid by our sister department, that marginal cost, what was the marginal cost for us of producing this product here by A? Is anybody who is able to see the marginal cost? How much was this product there? Eh? Right? A hundred, isn't it? A hundred, thank you very much. It was costing us a hundred. This new guy who is coming on board wants to charge us 140. So a hundred, you're right. So a hundred, you're right. So in this case here, there is an increase of 40 per unit. And how many units do we have in total, really? The units that these guys want us to produce. The units that they want us to produce the units that they want us to produce, the units which they want us to produce in total, we've been told, we've been told somewhere, it is their total production and sales for the component for a whole year. It is 2,200, 2,200, 2,200. I'll have to explain something here, ladies and gentlemen, please take here, 40 times 2,200, how much are we getting? How much are we getting? 40 times 2,200, how much are we getting there? 8,800 or 88,000. You know, this is 40. You know, this is 40. This is 40. 8,800, 88,000. Thank you very much. So 88,000 like that. So when you look at the cost versus, uh, the cost versus uh, the benefit, you are able to see that the cost is higher. The cost is higher than this one here will be 78,000, like that. So meaning that the farm, 
the firm will make a loss of 78,000 if division A, if division A is closed. If division A is done what here is closed, then the company will make a loss of 78,000. Now, a student may ask here, why do we charge 100 and not 165 here? Somebody may ask a very good question here. Somebody may ask a very good question here. Somebody may ask a very good question here. Somebody may ask here, but we have this transfer price which was being charged of 165. But remember the question is about the whole group, the whole company. And I always keep on telling you, ladies and gentlemen, assuming in this case here in the morning, uh, you woke up and you have uh, your great madam coming there and telling you, you know what, my husband, I want 50,000. That's a family arrangement. Right, so give her 50,000 within the group, within the family. Will this 50,000 really be ever refunded to you? Will it be ever refunded to you? Will it ever be refunded to you? No, no, it can't. But I don't know, in most cases, people say that uh, if it is the man who borrows, if it is a man who borrows, will the man be forgiven as well? If it is a man who borrows from the wife, will the man be forgiven as well? Will that debt be canceled? Will the debt be canceled? Must pay. Thank you very much for being honest. <laughs> Thank you very much for being very honest. <laughs> Because you'll be told that this money belongs to some charmer, isn't it? Right? And that is life. That's life. From today, I would want you to listen and listen to me very well. Whenever they talk about transfer pricing from the perspective of the whole group, internal transfers, transfer price becomes what here irre irrelevant. Whenever we are looking at uh, operations from the whole group, then automatically the transfer price becomes irrelevant. The group would have recommended that this sister department buys the goods at the marginal cost, which is what here, 100. So 100 would have been the effective. The 65 on top is profit, which was being earned from a sister department. And any internal profits, even from group consolidation, any internal profit is fake, is fake, is fake, is fake. So great, remember, the gentlemen of uh, send uh, very good uh, videos also on YouTube. Uh, and I remember I shared with you the one of variances. Were you able to get time to watch that particular video? Variance analysis. Do you get time to watch that video? I sent it to the group. I sent it to the group. And even this one, I'm going to put it on YouTube. Please, after you finish watching, don't, don't hesitate to make what here yeah, comments down there. Like, subscribe. Very important. Otherwise, we've come to the end of this particular. I sent, I sent, I see it, I sent. We've come to this particular end of this particular what year session. It has been a short one, but I believe you have learned something. You've learned something. Bye bye. Bye.